everyone. It's great to see you again. Thank you for coming to this lecture. As you know, I'm Jasmine. I'm a master's student at Stanford University, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Nikolai Petro. Dr. Petro holds a PhD in foreign affairs from the University of Virginia and teaches comparative and international politics at the University of Rhode Island. His history with Monterey goes way back as it's his first uh, full-time teaching appointment was here with the Monterey Institute, as it was known in 1987. He's also been an International Affairs Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, Special Assistant for Policy in the Office of Soviet Union Affairs in the U.S. State Department, and Temporary Political Attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. Dr. Petro has written for a variety of outlets, including The American Interest, New York Times, Boston Globe, Christian Science Monitor, Guardian, Nation, National Interest, and the Yale in Journal of International Affairs. He has also written or co-authored several volumes focusing on democracy and state building in Russia. And as you've seen from our very extensive reading list today, he's also quite active in the ongoing conversation surrounding the conflict in Ukraine. Please join me in giving a warm Monterey welcome to Dr. Nikolai Petro. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jasmine, for that lovely introduction. It's always nice to hear <laughs> all the things you've done. <laughs> Just a reminder. Uh, but um, hmm. so um, I have uh, written down some uh, points I'd like to make and give to you uh, in about, oh, I think, 20 to 30 minutes, highlighting, I hope, the most um, thought-provoking and controversial uh, aspects of, uh, of what I think about this crisis. And then I'd be happy to um, uh, hear your comments and uh, questions. So, um, so I call this talk, <clears throat> The Ukraine Crisis in Context. And uh, there are so many different contexts that I could talk about, but I'm going to focus on the, one, uh, the ones that I think are central and then try to tie it all together. Uh, the first point is that I have to make is the most important. There will be no peace in Ukraine until its domestic politics are brought into conformity with its cultural reality. Ukraine's declaration of independence in 1991 created a state with two cultural identities, unevenly divided between urban and rural, between wealthier and poorer regions, between the more and the less educated. Given the traditional disbalance in favor of Russian, the status of the Russian language and Russian culture in Ukraine immediately became an issue of political contention. Politicians from the westernmost region of the country, Galicia, who before 1939 had been part of Poland and before that of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, argued that the Ukrainian language should be given preference and the use of Russian restricted. State policy, they argued, should aim at creating a Ukrainian national identity based on their own Galician identity, which was now the only authentically Ukrainian identity left after all the damage done by the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union to Ukrainian culture. In those halcyon days, many Russophone Ukrainians seeking to distance themselves from the legacy of communism supported a gradual Ukrainianization, which as Ukraine's first president, Leonid Kravchuk explained to them in the run-up to the independence referendum of December 91, would ensure that they were quote, full-fledged owners, end quote, of the land and would, quote, guarantee you, Russian speakers, 
the preservation of full-blooded, unhindered ties with Russia and other sovereign states of the former Union, end quote. It is with this understanding that they voted in large numbers for Ukrainian independence at the end of 1991. But the very different historical memories of Eastern and Western Ukraine very soon led to mutually exclusive agendas for Ukraine's future. In Galicia's version of Ukrainian identity, Russia is the root of all evil. The reason there is corruption in Ukraine today is because Russia has imposed its own slave mentality on Ukrainians. The reason the country is not more prosperous today is because of Russia's unfair and colonial trade practices. The reason Ukrainian politics is so unstable is because Russia is always intervening. Since all problems point to Russia, the solution is to sever all ties with Russia. By contrast, in the Malaros version of Ukrainian identity, which predominates in the half of the country that is east of the Dnieper River, Ukraine is a distinct nation that is culturally and religiously still very close to Russia. Many Malaros Ukrainians see Russian and Ukrainian ethnic identities as interchangeable and believe, as Vladimir Putin does today, and Vladimir Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, did in 2014, that the two are one people. Rather than blame Russia for Ukraine's woes, Malaros Ukrainians blame the policies of the Ukrainian government since independence. They, the, they see the solution not in separating Ukraine from Russia, but in restoring their close ties. For more than two decades, these two regionally based national identities managed a tense coexistence by alternating the presidency between them, while at the same time stymieing the parliament's ability to function, thus preventing either regional identity from achieving total political dominance. Now, many art observers argue that this gridlock has thwarted economic and political reform in Ukraine. No doubt, that is absolutely true. But it was also Ukraine's way of avoiding civil war, which many assumed would erupt as soon as one side had enough control over the political system to turn its own cultural identity into a litmus test of civic loyalty. This is precisely what happened in February 2014, when President Yanukovych was ousted by a revolt led and manned by Western Ukrainians, a quarter of whom, in surveys taken at the time, identified with the most radical nationalist parties. According to Vladimir Ishchenko, Deputy Director of the Center for Social Research in Kiev, quote, tolerance of the far right against the, quote, greater evil of Yanukovych allowed the Svoboda party to play the most visible role in the Maidan protests and later helped to delegitimize them, the protests, for the majority of the population in southeastern Ukrainian provinces, thus forming the ground for the civil war." End quote. Yanukovych's ouster was seen as a violation 
of the delicate balance that had been established between Eastern and Western Ukraine, and therefore a direct threat to the core interests of Russophone Ukrainians. They responded by challenging his ouster on constitutional grounds. Two days after Yanukovych's removal, locally elected government officials from every region of the East and South but not one from the West, convened in Kharkov to condemn what they called an illegal coup d'etat. The delegation from Crimea even called for a national assembly to come up with a new federal constitution for Ukraine that would grant regional autonomy. Remember, Ukraine is a unitary state. Everything's run from Kiev. Meanwhile, as you will recall, the new government in Kyiv consolidated all power, executive, legislative, and military in the hands of the former head of Ukrainian security forces, Alexander Turchina. The stage was thus set for a confrontation between Western Ukraine, where the overthrow of the government was seen as an expression of the people's will, and Eastern Ukraine, where it was seen as a nationalist coup. This stalemate did not last long. In Crimea, the head of the Ukrainian Navy, along with more than 70% of the Ukrainian military, switched their allegiance to Russia immediately, making a military defense of the peninsula impractical. Crimea was annexed on March 21st, just four days after 80% of the total population voted to join Russia. The same scenario was brewing in another zone of historical conflict known as Donbass. But there, Russia responded very differently. When the rebels scheduled their own referendum, President Putin urged them to stand down. When rebel leaders went ahead with the vote anyway, and 66.8% of the population in Donetsk, the Donetsk region, supported what they called self-rule, and 77.8% of the total in Lugansk Oblast supported independence, Russia said, that while it respected the will of the people, it would not recognize these results. Second, after conducting military exercises near the Ukrainian border in late February, Russia returned its troops to their barracks in late April, after the beginning of Kiev's so-called anti-terrorist operation thus signaling that it had no intention of involving its troops in this conflict. Finally, in June, just as the Ukrainian military campaign in the East was ramping up, the Russian parliament recognized Petro Poroshenko as the new president of Ukraine and rescinded Putin's authority to use troops outside of Russia. After assuming office, President Poroshenko pledged victory in the East in a matter, he said, of hours. But when his offensive suffered a catastrophic defeat at Ilovaisk at the end of August 2014, he was forced to negotiate directly with the rebels. A second disastrous defeat at Dibaltseva in February 2015 led to the Minsk peace accords, which despite numerous violations have not yet been repudiated by either side because neither side sees any prospects for a military victory in the region. So what then is the end game and why has it been so elusive? As I said at the outset, 
any solution must bring Ukrainian politics into conformity with its cultural reality. There are two ways to do this. The first is to create a pluricultural Ukraine in which minority communities retain their different cultural and religious identities within the framework of a common Ukrainian civic identity. The second way is to create a culturally homogeneous Ukraine in which Russophone Ukrainians are subordinated by law and will thus be powerless to change their status. A pluricultural Ukraine would resolve the split in Ukrainian identity by defining it more broadly. A monocultural Ukraine would resolve it by making the identity and values of Galicia the norm for all Ukrainians. The pluricultural option is rejected by the current president and by the majority in the current Ukrainian parliament. The policies of both presidents Poroshenko and Zelensky have made the monocultural option much more viable for obvious reasons. <clears throat> there are now 6 million fewer Russophone Ukrainians under Ukrainian government authority than before the Maidan. This is a 28% reduction in the number of local voters, not counting refugees and Ukrainian citizens living in Russia who were not permitted to vote in the last Ukrainian national election. Moreover, as a direct result of the highly localized nature of the military conflict in the East, Russophone Ukraine has lost 43% of its GDP, 46% and 46% of its export capacity compared to 2012. The 10 largely Russophone regions that because of their higher levels of wealth, education and economic productivity were once able to sway national politics in their favor are now simply no longer capable of doing so. A monocultural Ukraine, therefore, seems inevitable. And the question that is currently being debated in the Ukrainian media is how to treat the remaining Russophone minority, which still constitutes a third of the population? Should they have the right to use their language in public or in public, in public functions? Will they be allowed to educate their children in Russian? Do they even form a part of what one should consider the indigenous population of Ukraine? A slew of legislation passed just this year has answered all of these questions negatively. Prominent nationalist intellectuals here in Ukraine have argued that Russophone Ukrainians will need to be re-educated into a proper appreciation of their lost or suppressed Ukrainian identity, or they should simply leave. Donetsk University professor Yelena Stashkina calls this, quote, positive, peaceful colonization, end quote. Others, like the deputy prime minister Alexei Reznikov, have argued for a more direct approach, the expulsion, or at the very least, depriving this group of Ukrainian citizens of the right to participate in political life for 25 years. I think it is far too late for that in Donbass already. Too much blood has been spilled there 
And I suspect that the region will continue to fight until the government in Kiev gives them either meaningful autonomy or independence. As for the rest of Malaros Ukraine, it remains to be seen whether the population there will assimilate, leave the country, or remain within it as a disgruntled minority. It is also possible, though unlikely in my view, that a more pragmatic form of Ukrainian nationalism will someday emerge. One that feels secure enough about its position within Ukraine then it no longer sees identifying and eliminating the domestic enemies of Ukraine as its top priority, and instead tries to establish a broader social base for governance. Such a national identity would presumably feel secure enough to mend ties with Russia, which for obvious geographical, cultural, historical and religious reasons remains the one indispensable nation for Ukraine. The classics of political science tell us that revolutionary movements tend to lose their fervor after the first generation passes and that politics and culture thereafter slowly shift back to their traditional historical patterns. What political science cannot tell us, however, is whether Ukraine as a nation state can survive that long. Next question I'd like to tackle is why is the West involved in Ukraine? Ukraine has been caught in the crossfire of East-West rivalry because of the Eurasian Union which Russian President Putin sees as the key to establishing Russia's regional hegemony, and the United States, therefore, sees as a threat. Since the United States cannot prevent the Eurasian Union from becoming what it is destined to become, namely, the largest commercial pathway for the new Silk Road connecting China to Europe and the Middle East, it has decided that at the very least, Ukraine must not become a part of it. That is why the United States and its NATO allies worked so hard to undermine President Yanukovych during the 2014 Maidan, and specifically why the peaceful transition of power from the Yanukovych government to the opposition that all sides had signed on February 22nd, 2014, was immediately repudiated by its Western authors. When it became clear that the more radical opposition had a chance to seize total control, Western government officials expected the restoration of order in Ukraine after the Maidan to be a mop-up operation lasting a few days or a few weeks at most. The popular unrest that erupted throughout Malaros, Ukraine, and that spilled over into outright rebellion in Crimea and Donbass came as a huge surprise because they had consistently minimized the importance of the cultural and social tensions within Ukrainian society. Since 2014, therefore, Western governments have essentially been engaged in defending their choice to back Galician Ukraine in its effort to impose a unitary national ideology, while at the same time being unwilling to commit the resources that would be needed to make that ideology succeed. Meanwhile, Russia has declared consistently since 2014 that it will not simply stand by and allow Galicia to conquer and eradicate 
Malaros, Ukraine. We have, we have achieved thus, in my judgment, the reverse of the judgment of Solomon in Ukraine. You'll recall that in this famous parable, King Solomon is asked to judge which of two women is the true mother of a child. And Solomon decides that the matter by ordering the child split in two. The true mother is revealed when she relinquishes her claim in order to save the life of the child. In this instance, we see the opposite. The West and Russia would rather see Ukraine torn asunder than let the other side have it. Many do not realize, however, that in this competition, Russia has an enormous advantage over the West. It retains overwhelming cultural influence within Ukraine, or parts of Ukraine, I should say, thanks to centuries of common history, language, and religion. Judging from last year's year-end tallies for searches on Google and YouTube, not to mention Kontakti and all the, all the other popular Russian search uh, engines, just Google and YouTube, Ukrainians still conduct searches overwhelmingly in Russian and for cultural content from Russia. Moreover, this appears to be true for young people as much as for older age groups. This means that for Russia, influencing the Ukrainian agenda is much easier than it is for the West. Given the variety of economic, political, geographic, cultural, and religious levers that it retains in Eastern and Southern Ukraine, there is an inexhaustible supply of pro-Russian actors. Russia, therefore, has a staying power in Ukraine that no other nation can match with the possible exception of Poland. As geopolitical realists like to point out, since power is applied not abstractly, but to specific regions with specific characteristics, in the case of Ukraine, it is Russia, not the United States, that will always be the superpower. But what about sanctions? Don't they change things? Sanctions allow politicians to claim that they are doing something when outright warfare is not an option. It solves their main problem, which is to not appear to be helpless. But as nearly every comparative study of the impact of sanctions has shown, they have little or no perceptible impact on the key decisions of the, of the target country. Senior US policymakers have acknowledged as much when they say, as they often do, that they do not expect Russian policies to change, but that it is nevertheless important to, quote, send a message, end quote. As French President Emmanuel Macron said of NATO, if your strategy consists of sending messages that you know will be ignored, then it merely demonstrates that you are becoming brain dead. The only option that actually has a possibility of saving all of Ukraine, and this is my solution to this problem, is to reverse course, to come up with an aid and a reconstruction package for Ukraine far beyond George C. Marshall's wildest dreams. The beauty of such a project, in my view, is that it would, be a, it would be a challenge so massive that it would require the combined resources of Russia, the EU, and the United States administered jointly over many years. At the same time, it would require placing the entire post-Soviet region into a broader context one that considers the needs of all of the constituencies that I mentioned previously, international, bilateral, and domestic, simultaneously 
looking at them in the context of a new international settlement. I know it is customary to treat complex diplomatic issues by breaking them down into smaller components so that each one can be negotiated separately. In this case, however, every attempt to achieve a settlement by taking parts of it out of the whole has failed. That is why we need to think bigger, not smaller. We need to be working toward a new treaty of Westphalia, or if you will, a post-Cold War summer, uh, a post-Cold War settlement, which we didn't have in 1991. The gist of this treaty would be the Russia, Russia and the US step back, Russia and Ukraine step back, and everybody stipulates that both Ukraine and Russia will be part of a new pan-European security framework, a European-wide framework that would welcome both Russia and Ukraine might just provide enough of an incentive for Russia and Ukraine to deal creatively with Donbass and Crimea, or failing that, to forego the benefits of European integration, investment, and security guarantees for both of them entirely. So there's a carrot and a stick. The pro a project of this magnitude demands a level of cooperation and trust among states that sadly seems to be beyond us today. Our political leaders would much rather shrink into their national shells, blame others for our failures and allow Ukraine to suffer its fate. We will pay twice over for this lack of vision and compassion. First, in the demise of Ukraine as we know it, its fragments falling into the very spheres of influence that Western governments so fervently claim to abjure. Second, in what I refer to as the great shift eastward, Russia's embrace of her Asian destiny. The great Russian polymath, Mikhail Lomonosov, famously predicted, quote, that Siberia is destined to magnify Russia's greatness, end quote. I fear this may yet prove to be America's most lasting contribution the latter half of the 21st century. Thank you.